you do this. I, I don't need to sit, so someone can have to that chair.
So there is a live streaming for those who can't fit in the room, uh, luckily. Uh, sorry about uh, the walls being too tight tonight. Toinen asia on poistumisjärjestys. Toivomme, että kaikki poistuu rivi kerrallaan, eli lähdetään sieltä ylhäältä rivi kerrallaan ylös, että ei saada aikaan tässä ovella valtavaa tunnusta. So uh, when once all this excitement is over, I'm asking you to leave the room row by row so that we don't create a huge mass of people at the door. So people on the most uppermost rows, please go out first and then row by row. Toinen, onko tämä nyt toinen vai kolmas käytännön asia? Täällä nyt siis otetaan valokuvia ja striimataan tämä tapahtuma. Ja jos haluatte ehdottomasti välttyä joutumasta mihinkään striimiin tai kameraan, niin sitten on ehkä parasta mennä ulkopuolelle tai ainakin yrittää siirtyä niin, että ette ole näiden kameroiden tulilinjalla. Se ei ole ehkä tällä aivan helppoa, mutta valokuvat nyt lähinnä otetaan meidän päähenkilöstä, joten selästä käsin yleisöstä. So uh, there will be photographs taken and the event will be streamed. So in a case where you definitely do not want to be in any photograph or streaming, you should try to place yourself so that you're not on the uh, fire line of the cameras or maybe go outdoors and, and look at the, the streaming. Okay, so that much for the practicalities. It is my uh, great pleasure tonight to welcome Professor Hartmut Rosa here at the University of Helsinki. Hartmut Rosa is Professor of Sociology and Social Theory at Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna, Germany, and Director of the Max Weber College at the University of Erfurt. He is also Affiliated Professor of Department of Sociology at the New School for Social Research in New York. His publications focus on social acceleration, alienation, resonance and the te temporal structures of modernity. Early on influenced by Charles Taylor, his work addresses the very constitution of human sociability on the one hand. On the other hand, he has been nominated as a leading voice of contemporary critical theory, and indeed in this vein, his work provides a prominent critique of contemporary capitalism and its excesses. His most recent works include Resonance, a sociology of our relationship to the world, and Uncontrollability Uncontro of the world, I think is the translation. Today his title is Social Acceleration, Alienation and Resonance. And as I said, we are really truly happy to welcome Professor Rosa to the University of Helsinki. Welcome, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to Helsinki. I've, I've never been to Finland before. I, I did have the time to walk around uh, a bit uh, uh, all over the city, actually, and I, I, so I really and truly hope it's not the last time I'm here because it's a very fascinating and interesting place. And, um, and it's a great opportunity for me also to, uh, to talk to you, and I really wish or hope that you will that we will have a, enter into dialogue after my presentation because it's my my strong belief really that what we what we need to do in social theory and if you want to develop social theory you need to talk to people all sorts of people in all sorts of places to get a sense of what could be a good account of our current situation i've just there's a new publication which i've co-written with my colleague uh, um, andreas Reckwitz. And it's about how should we do sociological theory or social theory, and it's and my my idea there is, and that's what I want to somehow also share with you, and 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 maybe uh, yeah, let, let, or let which I want to present to you and then discuss um, with you is the idea that in social theory, what we what at least one part, one task of it is trying to give the best possible account, the best account, that's a, uh, that's a term by Charles Taylor. He says, if there is a phenomenon which interests you, right, try to give the best possible account of that phenomenon, right? It's a little bit what the astronomers did. So they realized that sometimes it seems like planets are moving backward, 
So the question is, what is the best possible account of the phenomenon we see there, right? And I think it's something we can do in sociology, we need to do in sociology as well. And that includes giving the best possible account of the social situation we are in here. We are in this together. You could talk in English of the predicament, right? And I think a lot of people have the idea that we are in a certain in a crisis situation. Most of the time it has to do with the climate change, but not just with it, right? Also with the excesses of capitalism. Actually, my claim is that there's a kind of, there is a, a macro crisis, the ecological crisis, right? But there's also a micro crisis, the psychological crisis, which comes sometimes in the form of burnout, for example, and so on. And even a medio crisis in the form of uh, capitalism, but, uh, or, or political uh, problems, the crisis of democracy. But, uh, but if generally social thinking starts with a sense something is wrong here and then you need to give the best possible account of what could possibly be wrong here. So what I want to do is to give you my best account right, of the social situation we are in here together in the 21st century, so to speak. right? The, uh, and, uh, and then also to try to give, to, to give an account of how we possibly could go out of it. So when I say best account, it doesn't mean it's the best possible account. It's the best I can do in this situation. right? And I try to tr draw on all sources available to me, on theoretical sources, but also on a uh, on empirical data, uh, statistics, interviews, uh, phenomenological observations and so on. And I believe that such an account is of course always contested and preliminary because you will say, think that on some, in some arguments you, you would share and with other arguments you think they need requalification or refinement or sometimes contradiction. So I believe it's dialogically we can reinterpret who we are and, 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 and come to a better account. So what is, so what is my, on a, okay, before I come to the account, uh, I just want to give three arguments, three requirements of such a, of a social theory or of what I call the best account. I mean, I, I've somehow already indicated it uh, that I believe at least one, one task is to try to give a comprehensive account. What is the social situation, the situation of humanity in the early 21st century? And of course you could say, who are we here? Right? There are very different experiences. It is different when you're in Latin America, let's say in Paraguay, for example, or in Indonesia, or in some place in, in Senegal maybe, or in Kenya, or in Finland, or in Germany, and it's not just the country. It also depends on whether you're a, a, a male or female, or, or, or in between, or, or, um, or, or whatever, your, what your income is, and your age, and, and so on. But I believe Nevertheless, as human beings, we are self-interpreting beings and the self-interpretation should possibly be by all those involved, right? By all of us. So, of course, if you say, well, for me in Kenya, what you, Rosa, tell is wrong because of that and that experience, then I have to refine it. But nevertheless, I, I want to give a kind of comprehensive picture and I believe we need this, a kind of comprehensive self-interpretation. We need to keep a sense of society as a totality. Sociology is very often limiting itself to some aspects, right? Just to one relationship, work or gender or whatever it is. But I think we need to have a, a sense of how those things go together, how they influence each other, a comprehensive self-interpretation. And secondly, I believe such a best account should have a dual structure. The one is what I call here the third person account, right? It's a kind of, it's a view from the outside. Let us, uh, let us look at society as we look at the planets from the outside. I can describe how planets move. I can describe how the stock market works, right? Or how the political system works from the outside. I give a third person account. And in that sense, sociology is not so different from physics or chemistry or biology or whatever. I try to describe, to analyze how institutions work, how, what structures look like, etc. But I think what we also need is a so-called first-person account. If I want to understand society, our life, our predicament, I cannot just look at society as, as I look at the planets. I need also to look at the inside. What is motivating us, right? What, our, what are our hopes, our aspirations? And what, our, what are our fears and anxieties, for example, because they provide the motivational energy, right? They bring the dynamics into society that we are motivated by some things that we want to get to and some things we want to avoid. 
Sometimes I believe we are somehow driven by experiences, I call it oasis, right? Uh, it's some sense of this is where I want to go. And also we are running away from the desert. This, this is what I want to avoid. And we need to reconstruct this from the inside. And again, I, I will stop talking about it because it's a recurrent problem. Whenever I talk like this, there are always people asking, who are we? How do you think that my, your hope, my, my hopes and aspirations are identical with the hopes and aspirations of you, you or you or somewhere else? What I say is, or what I want to do is trying to give the best account. I tell you what I think are kind of generalizable hopes and aspirations and then let's discuss it and then you might say well actually I have a different uh, a vision or a different idea. Okay, but nevertheless I believe to understand a social formation as I describe modernity we have to have this dual account. Look at it from the outside. Describe it. What is the institutional logic that you can see? But also look at the inside. What are the powers, the psychological powers, the hopes and the fears or the desires driving driving us, driving actors. And then what I want to do, that's the critical theory stuff, so to speak. I really believe reflection, I've already said this, reflection normally starts from, um, from a sense something is wrong here. I mean, Max Weber made this point quite convincingly, right? He says, reflection is, you know, normally you don't reflect on things. They are just working. He says the centipede, you know, this animal which has a hundred or a thousand feet, <laughs> he says the centipede does not reflect on which food to put first and which put food to put second and so on. It only starts to reflect when, 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 when he starts to, uh, uh, to get confused, right? to stumble or fall. Right? When something is wrong, you start to reflect on how do we do it. Right? So uh, and nevertheless, I claim that we, uh, that, we, that we need to have three steps in the best account of our situation. The first is analytic. Right? What is the structure of this society, of this social formation? What is the motivational motives? Secondly, what are the problems? What could possibly go wrong? That's the diagnosis, right? Where does this formation run against walls or, or create crisis? And third, and of course this is contested, but I believe out of the analysis and the diagnosis, the critique of the situation, we need to, de to de develop, to create a sense of where we could go from here, how, sh how things could be other or different. Uh, because if social theory is supposed to have an impact on society to help solve a crisis, then we need to somehow connect the analysis with the critique towards a possible solution. Right? And it's not, a kind of, it, it's not a kind of fabricated solution which you impose from the outside, but it's part of the best account you give. It's, and then it, it's open for discussion. Right? Okay. So that actually uh, leads to this kind of heuristic structure, right? We need an analysis, a diagnosis or a critique and a possible therapy. I know that therapy is a very dangerous concept, right? Normally I only write it over here, I, I forgot about it, but normally I write it with quotation marks, right? Therapy is, is, is only metaphorically used, right? How could we possibly think of alternatives or ways out and on all these, these levels, I need a structural account or a view from the outside and a view from the inside, a culturalistic, so it's a kind of culturalistic or structuralistic uh, um, account. I mean, there are a lot of methodological problems involved here. But instead of going on talking about methodology, I want to go to the, <laughs> to the real substance, to the content. I'll just give you and that's a kind of dangerous undertaking. But since I didn't really know what you would want to discuss with me, is it resonance, is it acceleration, or is it uncontrollability, I thought, okay, let's put it all in one, right? I give you my complete account. And, then, <laughs> and, and that means we need to have six building blocks, okay? Let's start with the first one, right? We need an account of what, what characterizes our modern social formation. And I would say that's the structural, uh, the structural features of, uh, of, of, of your life in Finland as it is in Europe, uh, in, in, in Germany, or in China, or in Northern America. Of course, there might be, I mean, there certainly are some indigenous populations in the Nicomares or Andabares, for example, which, for, for which this analysis would not be true. But for most of us living in the so-called modern f formation, uh, uh, it's true. My claim is, you know, there's a lot of discussion. What is... What is modernity? 
And uh, there are a lot of people who say, let's forget about this term. It's too complex, right? For, it's too complex for two reasons. For on the one hand, modernity, or, or for three reasons. On the one hand, modernity is different in China or Japan from it is from Finland or from Northern America or from Southern America. And secondly, modernity has not always been the same, right? In 1800, it was very different from 1900 or 1960s or from the present. And, and worse, and modernity has always been in a kind of ethnocentric conception, right? Modern, modern or the, mod, the modern or modernity is the good thing, and those who are not yet modern should get there. So I, I think I have a definition, I hope, a definition and an analysis which is true for all the places I talked about and even for all those epochs, right? And this is the, and it's not ethnocentric because I believe it's not ethnocentric because it's because it and it's not. Because it's not, for me, the modernity is not per se good, it's just a description. Look, this is the description. I claim that a society, however you define society, there are sociological problems involved with this too, but it doesn't matter. A society can be called modern or is modern when, how did I formulate it? When its mode of stabilization is dynamic. And that means that it systematically requires material growth, technological acceleration, and cultural innovation in order to reproduce its structure and to maintain the institutional status quo. This, is, this was the basic idea of my book, Social Acceleration, already. So what do I mean? It might sound complicated if you're not an academic, um, but it's a, it's a simple idea. And I believe it's really true for the, the, our predicament in the 21st century. The problem is that no matter how hard you work in Finland this year, next year you have to be faster, more productive, and more innovative, and more creative, just to maintain what you have, the number of, of jobs, right? But also the welfare systems, right? The, the, if you want to pay the pension schemes and the health care, and, 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 and maintain the cultural spaces and museums and so on. Next year, you have to be a bit more efficient, a bit more faster, right? The process of optimization, rationalization, it goes on and on and on. And it's true for us as individuals. Normally, I'm sure, a lot of you, maybe you came because you feel that you're always short on time, always pressed, right? And the bad news from this is that no matter how pressed you are this year, next year is going to be worse. <laughs> I know it's bad, but, but it's really true. I think we live on self-delusion. People always say, when you ask people, uh, how, how is it going these days? 90 out of 100, not everyone I know, the predicament has to say, okay, there's, for example, some people who are unemployed. They suffer from the logic of, uh, of, of acceleration too, but in a different form. They might have a lot of time, but their time is completely devalued, right? I mean, it's socially uh, devalued, but for the others, no, I forgot my argument. For the others, uh, <laughs> normally, uh, normally um, uh, being short on time is a kind of everyday reality, right? And, and we always say, if you ask people how, how is it going, they would say, oh, I, I'm quite okay, I'm doing quite well, but, I'm, but right now everything is so stressful or hectic. And then I always say, forget about the right now, right? It's not going to get better. And this is, it's just, it's an empirical reality. <laughs> okay. Uh, but of course, you can, you can describe it through acceleration, but also through the dependence on growth, right? I mean, for example, in Germany, we now will, we are going to have a new government, right? The so-called uh, traffic light coalition, because it's red for the social democrats, green for the greens, and yellow for the, for the liberals. And all of these parties say we need growth. Right, we need to grow out of the crisis, so let's, let's, get, let's achieve more economic growth. Now, now, actually, then I ask them back, okay, what kind of growth would you want to achieve? More cars? And then the Greens would say, oh, not really, right? So I say, oh, okay, not cars. Okay, more planes? Not really, right? Okay, okay, maybe not traffic. Okay, so what do we, would you like to have more? Maybe more houses? And that's a bad idea too. Maybe in Finland it's okay because you're such a vast country. I think you're just as big as Germany, right? But in Germany or in, in, in Switzerland, for example, right, it's a real problem that there's less and less space because we, 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 we build it all up and, 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 and make it full with concrete. So most people would say, not, let's not grow in this respect either. So, okay, then let's have more computers or more cell phones. It's not a good idea either, right, for, 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 for a lot of resources. So I, actually, I can throw up my hands in despair and ask him, so where do you want to grow? Well, maybe in nourishment, we should eat more. Not a good idea either. <laughs> I, I mean, 
I, I mean, by the way, all of, the, all of our economic sectors try to achieve growth. I mean, they need to grow. Our automobile industry desperately wants to sell more cars next year than they do this year. And it's the same with the, with the, with the, uh, with the production of food. You know how they do it? I mean, with those who can pay for the food, right? The problem is that most of them already eat too much, right? Obesity is becoming a problem all over the so-called modern world. Now, nevertheless, the food production industries need to grow. Oh, oh <laughs> sorry. <laughs> How do they do it? I mean, it's really, it's really amazing. I mean, they achieve it by somehow, you know, there is normally, if you eat food and if you have enough, there are signals from the stomach sent to your brain, I'm full, I have enough. Now they found ways to somehow stop that signal, right? It's really by, 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 by doing some form of ens enzymes, I don't know what the English word is for this, some, some sort of uh, artificial um, 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 uh, substances into the food, stop the signal. So you keep eating even so you already have enough. So the problem is, how do you achieve growth if you have too much of everything? Of course, there are people who do not have enough in Africa, for example, but also in other places. But they don't count in this systemic logic, right? Because they don't have the means to pay for it. So the problem is, even though we know that growth is, prob is super problematic for economic reasons and for ecological reasons, the system requires it. We, we need, I mean, all of the parties are, are sure it's the same for the, for, for the remaining parties in Germany. There's basically no party that doesn't want to achieve economic growth. We, we, we can discuss whether there is merely, quanti no, merely qualitative economic growth. I would really wonder how, how you could do it. Um, I, I would say you couldn't do it. But nevertheless, the, the systemic logic, my analysis, the first building block is we need to accelerate, to grow, to innovate endogenously, not be, because we are forced from the outside, not even because we have the wish from the inside. For example, it's not that we want to eat more and don't have enough food, but the food industry somehow needs us make eat more. And it's the same with the cell phones. They need to sell more cell phones every year, otherwise Apple, Apple stocks will go down. How do they do it? They give you a contract that says every, every other year that you, will get, you will receive a new phone or, and so on. I stop at this point, I could go on forever. I mean, the question is, <laughs> the question is, why is this so? Of course, there at this point, you cannot really refrain from talking about capitalism. It's the MCM formula here, money, commodity, money, prime. The whole logic of our economy is such that you only invest money into something, like, like, a, like building, a, building a company or, a, or a, a, a factory, for example, that's the C, commodity. If, there is, if you expect to get more money out of it than you invest, right? the idea is that more money comes out of the investments. That's the, the M prime, money prime, more money. But this logic of maintaining the system through permanent increase, surprisingly, is not just in the economy. It's even, for example, in science, right? I mean, for, I mean, I mean, for, for those of you who speak German, because there's quite some of them here, right? In the German word, you hear it, you hear it very well, Wissenschaft, right? The idea is that the whole system of Wissenschaft can only maintain itself, it, it has its own rationale, not in kind of handing down knowledge from one generation to the next, which is a kind of, every culture do that, right? All cultures have a certain stock of knowledge about life, about how to sow and how to reap, for example. Uh, but a uh, so, so form of science, which is the highest form of knowledge in our situation, only lives from permanently increasing the horizon of what is known, right? Wissenschaft is, is pushing the horizon. Next year, no matter, how much we, no matter how much we know this year, next year we need to know more, otherwise there is no Wissenschaft, right? Wissenschaft is not about preserving knowledge, it's about pushing the limits. And it's the same even in the arts, right? It's not a mimetic form anymore, it's creating something going beyond what others have done before. So what I want to say is our, the best account of the, the logic, the institutional, the structural logic of the society is such that we can only stabilize ourselves, our systems dynamically by permanent increase. Right? Of course, this has to do with rationalization in the sense of Max Weber. Now, the question is, let's move to the inside. Right? Why do we, is, is it that we want to run faster next year? Probably all of you would say no, no, actually it's fast enough, not in all respects, but in most respects, right? And we don't even 
don't grow, we, we don't necessarily want growth, etc. So the question, I mean, at least, okay, I have to put it differently. <laughs> I mean, structures and institutions cannot cannot accelerate and innovate by themselves, right? So where does the energy come from? Where does the, it, why do we innovate and accelerate and grow every year? So somehow we have to get to the inside. What is motivating us as subjects to come up with acceleration, innovations, with growth, etc. right? And my, so, so, so look, look to the insights. What is the, where is the energy coming from, right? It's not, the, it's not an institution, a factory that achieves growth or acceleration. And my claim is that there are two kind of, two, two kind of sources for, of cultural energies. One, of course, is fear. As subjects, we are, I, I would say we are not driven. Very often you find, well, it's the insatiability, the greed of modern subjects that's behind the system. We never have enough, right? We always want more, 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 more. But I believe that is not the main driving force. I'm pretty sure it's not, right? Because I think, I think it, it, it's not greed, it's fear that is driving subjects. Even students, right? I mean, the, it's f the fear of losing out, of being left behind, of not being fast enough, of not being good enough. From all I know, particularly about younger generations, I really believe it's, it's, it's incredible. In a, in a society like ours, which is so rich, so wealthy, has, has such a stock of knowledge and productive means, how can it be that young people, but also other people, are so afraid of not having a legitimate place in the world, of not being good enough, right? Of, of kind of falling out of the systems and so on. And that has to do with the fact that a system, that the logic of dynamic stabilization puts all of us in a situation like standing back, standing on downward escalators, right? Your place in the world. I, I believe we as human subjects need to have a sense of where we are in the world, where we belong to, right? Where we fit in. And the problem is, it's like standing on a downward escalator. If you don't run upward, right, and, and, uh, and accelerate yourself, you're losing ground relative to the others, right? Or it's, it's, it, and the problem is, it's not just one escalator. Like, for example, when I buy a computer, I always buy the newest model and the most expensive one nowadays because I want to have it as long as possible. But nevertheless, as soon as I kind of set it up at home, it says, your virus protection is not up to date, right? Your Adobe reader is not up to date and so on. So I'm already on a downward escalator. So I have to permanently invest on the hardware and on the software, but it's the same as in academic life. It's the same with my publications, with research applications, with everything, right? If, you, if I don't run upwards, I'm uh, going downwards. And the younger generations, they are, I'm always happy if there are also younger people talking uh, mm -hmm. with us. And you know, it, it's the same in the social media, right? If you don't, in Snapchat or so on, your flames will die. If you do not permanently, <laughs> yeah, if you don't permanently work on your status, that's dynamic stabilization, right? To, to, to keep in the game, you permanently have to invest. So people are driven by fear of losing out and actually of losing the job, of course, is the big threat, is the one big threat that it actually leads to social death. It doesn't necessarily lead to physical death because you get there are welfare benefits and we are so rich that probably people will give you something, but it's a kind of social death. If if you don't have work, if you're not a working element in the system, then then it's you know it's losing the sense of self-efficacy and losing the sense of have, having a legitimate right, right, also to to be nourished. And this kind of social death in, in so-called indigenous society can kill people, and I believe it can kill people here too. Just look at how, how, how um, and the health condition of the unemployed. So what I want to say here is one driving force is fear. It's anxiety, right, of not fitting in, of being left behind, of becoming, um, of losing track. So we have to dance faster and faster just to stay in place. But that's not the only answer to the driving force, because it would simply be wrong to claim that this logic of accelerating, innovating, growing is only driven by fear. There's also a kind of an aspiration, right? It has even to do with our conceptions of freedom, breaking free from the past, and with our conception of happiness. And this conception of happiness, I call, it, I call the triple A conception of the good life. And what I mean is really, and I'm deadly serious about this, right? 
we really experience, we, I think we have come to define the good. What is good? If you think for yourself, think of something you really find good. <laughs> right? Normally, or most often, it's something that increases the horizon of what is available or attainable or accessible. Right? In German, it's, I call it Weltreichweitenvergrößerung. Right? <laughs> what we dream of is that we are capable of of increasing, of expanding the horizon of what we can attain or make available or accessible. For example, why is money interesting for most of us, right? Because it pushes the horizon of what you can, what you can afford. If you're really rich, you can buy the flat, the apartment in the best part of Helsinki. If you're poor, you cannot even pay for the, for the, for the, for the cellar apartment in the worst part of Helsinki or, or somewhere else. Maybe you cannot rent, afford a home anywhere, right? If you're rich, you can pay for the trip to the, uh, I don't know, the Philippines. Right? If you're poor, you cannot even buy the ticket to Turku or so, right? <laughs> so if you're rich, you can, uh, I can go on forever, right? Money, Money is really defining the horizon of what is available, attainable and accessible to you. And that's why people think it's good if they have higher salary, higher wages, higher whatever it is, right? And look at the billionaires, people like Musk and Bezos and how they are ever called. They are pushing the horizon of what is available and attainable to them now literally to the outer space, right? I mean, it's amazing. It's pushing the horizon of Weltreichweiten, of the Weltreichweite. <laughs> Um, but it's not just, I think I've put it down here, it's also why is t the, with technology, I mean, I really find this, I find this convincing, right, it's my best account. I mean, when you think of a kid, right, getting a bicycle and coming to ride the bicycle is a great moment. Why? Because with a bicycle, literally, the horizon of your world is increasing. Now I can go by myself to the lake in the village or whatever it is, right, I, I, and, 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 and so on. And then when you grow a little older, I think in Finland you have, might have a lot of rural areas too. I know it from my own upbringing in the Black Forest. Then with 15 you get the moped and then you can go to the neighboring village on your own. Probably there is not much to do, you rather run into trouble there, but nevertheless the horizon increases. And everyone dreams of turning 18 and being capable of, t of taking the car. Then we can even go to the big city, which was Freiburg at that time or so. And with a plane you can go to London and New York and so on. So pushing the horizon of availability is driving the development of technology. And of course, this is why we are all addicted to this thing here. It's incredible. The horizon of availability and attainability and accessibility has exploded with it. Right now I have 70 or no, probably 100, billion, no, 100 million titles of music available with one click and thousands and thousands of books and movies and all the knowledge. It's all there with one click, just one click away. So the, the expansion of the horizon of the available, the attainable, the accessible is the positive force. That's what driving, what's driving us. And this is why I think it's the same in Finland. I swear, no, no, no I don't swear. <laughs> but I think it's the same in Finland. If you live in a, somewhere in some other parts, young people probably will move, want to move to Helsinki if they can afford to. So ask them why. Why do you want to go to Helsinki and not stay in the nice place in, I don't know, Lapland or wherever it is? They will certainly tell you because in Helsinki there is the museums, there is the operas, the theaters and, and so on, right? And the shopping centers and the soccer stadiums and so on. And probably they will never go to the opera or the theater, right? But the fact that it is available, attainable, accessible is what makes it attractive. It makes big cities attractive all over the world. Right, so my second answer here is, from the inside, we are driven by the desire to expand the horizon of the available, the attainable and the accessible. And by the way, Corona was very interesting in that respect, right? because it has made our world shrink extremely, at least in the physical uh, horizon. Right? During lockdown, the, the, the horizon of the available, the attainable and the accessible is kind of uh, circled around your apartment. So now we go to the third building block. What could be wrong with it? Isn't that a good social formation? Actually, you could say, and a lot of people say that, it's, this is a wonderful, this is wonderful, really. Because capitalist modern societies are extremely stable. I mean, it's really amazing, right? They seem to go through all the crises. Maybe we even manage the ecological crisis. Dynamic stabilization is a wonderful mode of stabilizing a social uh, system. And that we are driven by, the, by this desire 
which then also is fulfilled in, in most uh, cases technologically and otherwise economically, that for everyone or for most, or at least for, for the most part of the, of the population, the horizon expands, is, expands isn't that great. Now I say, well, it's, it, might be, it might be, we should not do away with it too quickly. Right? There are a lot of advantages there, but there are serious problems. So now I come to the diagnosis part, and on a structural level, what could be problematic with a society that only stabilizes its institutions dynamically? I claim that there is, the problem is a crisis, a growing crisis of desynchronization. And the idea here is that not all spheres of life can be accelerated at the same pace or to the same degree. Right? You could say not every, not every social system or not, e not every part of life or the world is speedable to the same extent. Right? And the problem is that the faster systems or social groups systematically put pressure on the slower ones. Whenever one thing or one sphere accelerates, it's not necessarily a problem. You have a fast system, you have a slow system, that's fine. We have that in social life everywhere, right? The problem is where those two intersect, right? For example, you have a train system, let's say in Germany, right? Oh, our train system don't work anyway. But <laughs> let's assume uh, you, you have a train system and normally, of course, they try to set up the timetable, the, the, the timetable of the, of the train such that when one train arrives right shortly after, for example, you arrive with a fast train, with a, with a, with a inter-regional train, with a long track train, and then you go to the regional train. Now, if the, if the fast train accelerates, you arrive a half an hour earlier than before, right? So I, I, it no longer takes me to get from, from, let's say, from Berlin to Freiburg. It doesn't take me seven hours as before. It only takes me six and a half hours. The problem is if the regional train doesn't speak up, they speed up or adapt, right? Then I have to wait, simply to wait for 30 minutes until the slow train leaves, right? So whenever you have a, something fast and something slow and they intersect, it creates desynchronization. The fast one puts pressure on the slow one. It's like, look, it's like, or you could also say in interaction in the, in the, if I'm a salesperson and I'm a really slow, I like to talk to my customers for a long time. That's really nice. But if a customer is very short on time, he, 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 might, be, <laughs> he, he might like to kill me, right? Because he doesn't want me to talk to all the, uh, and, and so on. So the problem is fast uh, systems put pressure on slow system and risk desynchronization. And if you look at it structurally, I believe you can see it on four levels. One is there is desynchronization between the social society, so to speak, and, and the ecological rhythms, the rhythms of nature. We are too fast for nature, or nature is too slow, right? Because the social rhythms of the metabolisms speed up, and that creates a problem for nature. So it's not a problem that we fish. The, but the fish the oceans, right? But it's a problem if we fish to, at a pace which is so fast that the fish cannot reproduce. And it's not a problem that we cut down trees. The beaver, the animal, has cut down trees for hundred thousands of years, right? Or, um, yes, for hundred thousands of years. But we cut down the trees at a pace which is so fast that the forests cannot regrow in many um, areas of the world. So the, and even, by the way, it's very interesting, what we call the global warming is a problem of desynchronization because heating up something, we are heating up the atmosphere, and you know what that means physically or a chemi chem in, 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 this, in the chemical sense? It means to make the molecules spin faster. Heating a gas up makes making the molecules spin faster. And this is an effect of the acceleration on Earth down here, which is driven by carbon energy is mainly, right? So it's really, it's a desynchronization between the... the, the, the the engraved, uh, the, the proper times of, uh, of the atmosphere and what we do um, down here. I, by the way, I believe there is also, you know, this is the one level between society and the atmosphere which is around us, the, 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 the ecosphere of the world even. But I believe it's also desynchronization between social systems, between politics and the economy, for example, right? Because democracy is a time-consuming process. Democracy takes time. Democracy is not just about taking votes. Democracy is a process of deliberation, right, of consensus formation. So, and so at articulate, you have to articulate different positions. You have to deliberate about where to go. And then decision taking and implementation takes time too. And the more dynamic and complex, I've written a lot on this, 
and there are people in Finland also working on it, right? The, the, the more complex and dynamic a society gets and the, 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 the further the consequences of our actions stretch out, for example, if you go for nuclear energy, it has consequences for thousands of years or for genetic engineering, right? So the more complex a, a, a society gets, and the, more, um, and, and the more dynamic it gets, and the longer the chains of interaction become, the slower pro the, the democracy works, or the longer it takes time to reach democratic uh, decisions. But now the economy is speeding up, and the economy, the markets need political decisions, and the media have been, have, did speed up a lot too. So you have two fast systems and one slow system, and I believe this is a, 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 one of the core... Um, uh, reasons for the, for the democratic crisis we're experiencing. There's even within the sphere of the economy uh, for, uh, a very interesting form of desynchronization, namely that the, what we call real economy, right? the building of houses, of cars, and even of clothes, is quite time consuming. And what is even more time consuming is the consumption of things. I mean, look, at my favorite example there is a book. It takes a long time to write a book. It also takes quite a long time to read a book. And actually, you have only consumed the book if you've read it, right? Not if you've bought it. So now the problem is, <laughs> yeah, this, is very, this is very interesting, right? Um, so, so real production and consumption is time consuming, whether you talk about houses, about cars, about clothes, or about books, or about piano. It's even worse with pianos, because it takes a long time until you can play it. Now, but the financial markets, right, the financial economy is speeding up. It almost goes at the speed of light, and the it's done by algorithms. It's faster than humans can think or decide even. And there is serious desynchronization between the speed of the financial markets and the speed of the real economy. I, I believe there is proof, right, if you look at it, to see that some of the worst economic crises we've seen, the 2008 crisis, for example, can be explained at least in part by this huge desynchronization. And by the way, I mean, what they're doing right now, it seems in the corona crisis, they are pumping a lot of money into the financial markets and only a very tiny fraction of it goes to the real economy. So the, the growth process is in serious crisis because of this form of e economic desynchronization. But I believe there is even the... De now, you know, I've started with the social system. You can think of the social system as in the middle. And then the ecological spheres are around the social system, uh, on the macro level, so to speak. But there's also micro level, namely the psychological level, the individual level. And I believe there is even a desynchronization with, our, with the human soul. Basically, you could say our soul is too slow for the speed of the social sphere. And this is playing out, this is showing in the what you could call the burnout crisis, as we know from the uh, World Health Organization, they claim that psychological uh, disorders, uh, affective disorders, psycho, uh, how do you call them, psychosomatic disorders, and um, and even forms of uh, mental, uh, all forms of mental health, uh, are showing signs of of an worsening uh, process, right? And but basically, you know, I mean, there's always been this has been contested. It's particularly, I found this really interesting when when I claim that I was. I mean, sociologists never talk about soul, right? And the psychologists don't talk about souls either. It's the theologians who believe in a soul. But I say I don't care whether you call it soul or psyche. But there is something like the burnout, right? And, and, and it's interesting that sociologists say, okay, burnout thing, it's just a discourse. It's a way of talking. Right now, uh, it, it, because the fact that numbers of burnout are significantly increasing could be a stat statistical or social or cultural artifact, right? That means now we see burnout everywhere, but people are just as healthy as they always were or just as sick. Now, this argument always comes from sociologists. When you talk to psychologists and doctors, right, they say there really is a problem there. But I don't know. I'm not a doctor. So my claim is that you can, you can, you can see this crisis not just from the, those who really fall into burnout, but from the fact that burnout is such a huge discourse all over the world. I'm pretty sure for you it's true too. I really wonder, I don't know whether I can make this experiment, why not? I mean, who, who, have, who, who of you sometimes think maybe I should slow down, otherwise I might be threatened by burnout? Yeah, yeah, you see, that's exactly, it's amazing. I should have photographed this. <laughs> Basically everyone, right? It's really true. I, I, it's certainly true for me too. I sometimes think that, right? And it's true all over the world. 
So, it's, so there is this anxiety that we are kind of burning out from the inside. And look, it's not amazing. Accelerating things, I said, is heating them up. And we are kind of heating up the global atmosphere, that's the ecological crisis, and we are heating up our psychosphere, that is the burnout crisis, right? And now my next book probably will be called Social Energy. I think we, amazingly, we don't have a conception of energy beyond the, the, the physical level. And I think, you know, and this acceleration game needs, it requires the investment of physical energy, carbon-based or, or solar-based or whatever, of political energy and of psychological energy. It's us who has to produce both acceleration and innovation. This might lead to a, a psycho-crisis. But of course, with a psycho-crisis to really understand this, what is our fear? You know, very interesting. I, I should do this every time now. Ask people whether they sometimes fear that they might have burnout. You all had your hands up, right? <laughs> now, now, what is burnout? Right? For me, burnout is... The, 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 the worst manifestation, the, probably the worst possible manifestation of what I call alienation, right? So that's the insight. You know, we are at the middle level of, my, uh, of, of, of what I want to tell you. And the question is, what could possibly be wrong? And we have the desire of increasing the horizon of the available, the attainable, and the accessible. Where could this go wrong? And my claim is, when I increase the horizon of availability, attainability, and accessibility, but somehow, you could say, I don't profit from it anymore. And, and, and let, me make, let me make this argument <laughs> in my most personal form. I really, you know, for me, music really is important, right? And I realized that I really, I, I always, music somehow was what was driving me when I came to a city like Helsinki, right? The first thing I would do is I would search out the, the stores where they sell records and CDs, right? It's a kind of permanent, uh, this is how I came to learn the geography of a city. So you could say now with Spotify you gain so much, right? Now you don't have to hunt for the CD, I don't have to pay for it, I just pay 9 euros per month and then I have 100 million titles of music available 24-7, 24 /7, right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it should be a huge benefit, but there is a huge danger. Now I have it. Now the music doesn't speak to me anymore. It's lost its, attra its attractivity. It's, it's almost no longer a good in my life, right? At least possibly. And that, that, mean, that would mean it's an element of alienation. I do have all these things available, attainable and accessible, but they don't speak to me anymore. They don't touch me. They don't move me. They have lost their significance. And many relationships and many options but they somehow don't touch you, they don't move me. It's like a frozen situation in life. Let's, let me give you the, de the definition. Alienation defines a mode of being in the world in which there is no internal or vibrant relationship. Right? That, that's what I just said. I, now I do have, I, I do have, it's almost a relationship, 100 million titles on Spotify, but somehow they seem all the same. It's the same with Facebook or Snapchat. Yeah? I have. I don't know, 200 followers on Snapchat, Snapchat and 500 fans, friends on Facebook, but somehow I feel I can't reach out to them, right? And they don't reach me anymore. That's alienation. It's defined by Rahel Yegi and others as a, re, a non-related non relationship, eine Beziehung der Beziehungslosigkeit. It means, for example, you might sit here, in a, if you sit here, actually, if you're in the middle of one of those rows, you might very well suffer alienation. You can see alienation, you can, there's a very easy test for alienation. If you ask yourself, what am I doing here? Right? If you get the feeling I'm in the wrong place, that's alienation because yes, you do have a place here. You, you, you do have even a relationship because you probably you came here because you're a student or because you're in the, in the, in the, in the community or maybe your teacher or your mother or your father or your friend forced you to come here. <laughs> and you are alienated if you think, I don't like the people here, they're very strange, right? I don't know, not, not diverse or probably also. And what this guy is talking about, it's totally crazy, it has nothing to do with my life, right? That's alienation, you feel disconnected. You ask yourself, what am I doing here? And if, if, it's, only in the, if it's only in this session, it's not bad. But if you ask yourself this all your life, in your job, yes, I have a job. But somehow, I don't know, 
it's so meaningless. Yeah. It doesn't speak to me. It doesn't touch me. It doesn't move me. It's, and, and, and I have a family, but when I sit with them at the table, I ask myself, what, 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 what is their relationship to me apart from I have to, to, to wash the dishes afterwards or so, right? So that's alienation, right? Alienation is when you have a horizon of the available, the attainable, and the accessible, but no vibrant internal connection. And, you can, and, and, and your, your life is alienated. When you have the feeling, everything that is out there, all the places I could go to, all the music I could listen to, all the movies that are there, they are all the same to me, right? They don't, they, they, they have lost their attractivity. It is really, I want to reformulate it in my next book in the, in the terms of energy, right? I don't feel that they are kind of attracting me. And there's nothing in me that kind of wants to reach out to them. Yes, I have these friends on Facebook and Snapchat. I have the 100 million titles. I have the movies. I have the job. But, but it's all gone, as you say, see here, deaf, dead, gray, silent. And of course, the generalized state of affairs is called depression or burnout. When people are in burnout, they say exactly this. The world out there is deaf, dead, silent, and gray, and within me, everything is deaf, dead, silent, and gray, right? It's a non-responsive relationship. That means the world has gone hostile or indifferent. And my claim is that this is the, this is the cardinal fear, the basic fear of modernity, that we could make the world available, attainable, and accessible, but it doesn't speak to us. I leave this away, it would take too much. If someone wants to have the slides, you're, you're absolutely free to have them. Um, but let's now go to the therapy. I mean, this is my, my fifth building block is my weakest one because it's the diff most difficult one. I want to do not want to talk too much about it, but uh, because it's really difficult, I think we have to do it together. It's a political challenge. Now, I said, you know, I said this society can only stabilize itself dynamically through growth, acceleration, innovation, and that means to problems to, of desynchronization. Now, of course, the solution, the way out, would be a different mode of stabilization, right? So I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure this society, this social formation, needs to go beyond the mode of, sta of dynamic stabilization. And that means we should not be forced to grow, accelerate, and innovate every year when there is no good reason for it, just to keep what we have. I mean, ask the, ask the German new government, when do you think the economy is big enough? Let's go 100 years from now. I mean, it's amazing because you, 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 know, you, get, you, you, you get exponential growth curves, even if you have only one, even if you have only one or let's say 2% growth, right? So from one year to the next, it's not much, but in, if you look at it in the long range, it's kind of doubling every, every 50 or 70 years. So when is the economy big enough? Then they would say never, because the system can't stabilize otherwise. When are we fast enough? Never. We have to, next year we have to run faster. That's totally idiotic. It's perverse, right? So the question is, what, what, should we, what, what, should, what could the solution be? And theoretically, we need a different mode of adaptation, but that means, but, but, it, but we could not go static, right? St stage, st uh, steady state societies, I mean, it depends on how you interpret them, but what is clear is that a society can never, if it tries to freeze down, let's not change anything, right? Let's just keep what we have. Then it will probably die out because life is dynamic. Change is inherent to us. And there's even curios curiosity. Sometimes we come up with a great idea. So of course we should innovate, be able to innovate or to grow or to accelerate. If the new virus comes in, then of course we should be capable of innovating as fast as possible, right? So, so we don't need a steady state society, but we need a society, I call it adaptive stabilization. Here's my definition. A society's mode of stabilization can be called adaptive instead of dynamic. When it is capable of growth, acceleration and innovation in order to change the status quo, but when it is not forced to increase in order to reproduce the institutional and structural status quo. That means, because you know, sometimes when I make this argument, people say, but don't you think it's a good idea if you produce more food in some areas of Africa where there is hunger? Of course, that's not dynamic stabilization because then you want growth or innovation to change the status quo. But in Finland, I assume, and in Germany, we need growth, acceleration, and innovation, not to change anything, but to keep what we have. And that, that's, as I said, in my view, per perverse. So what, we, so what we are looking for is for a society capable of growing, innovating, and accelerating when there are good reasons for it. And the good reasons should be decided politically or culturally and not forced by an inherent, let's say, capitalist mechanism. 
And in Jena, we had for eight years a project running on post-growth society. I call it not degrowth. My goal is not even degrowing because that's just turning a problematic thing 180 degrees around. Then normally you don't get a good thing out of it, right? <laughs> but get beyond the, this, as I said, be, be, be the blind need to uh, grow. But for this, we need an economic, probably even a revolution. I mean, this is, a, of course, that's maybe that's the core question. I'm, I'm not saying, I think we have to go beyond the current form of capitalism. There's no way around it, right? Driven by the financial markets as our system is right now, we will never get out of dynamic stabilization. But I would not go as far to say there should never be competition or, or markets. Markets are really great in uh, somehow accommodating uh, between uh, supply and demand. But I think markets should be controlled politically or culturally, re-embedded in the sense of uh, uh, um, Polanyi. And in order to achieve this, we also need political re reforms and maybe a culture and a cultural revolution. This is my last building block, then I'm done. Uh, on the political reform uh, or on the reform thing, I think uh, the logic of the welfare state needs to be rethought. I'm personally, am in I am in favor of an unconditional basic income, which could help a lot uh, there. So, but as I've said, since the system is not just driven, not just driven by institutional requirements, but also by our conception of the good, our conception of the good is that life gets better if we expand the horizon. And I think I've proved, I hope, that that's not necessarily true. It might lead to alienation. So what we need actually is a different sense of the good, a different conception of the good life. So the question is, when does your life get better? When you expand the horizon of, of the music available to you, of the movies available to you, of the places you can go to. And I claim not necessarily for most people, for the rich people at least, that's the wrong way. So we need and we know what it could look like. This is of course, I've, I've spent a lot of time on this and I believe, I, be, I believe I found a good answer to this. When is life really, when is life really good, right? And actually, I don't, I don't talk about the good life in German. It's very hard. It's very, you cannot translate this. This is actually another problem. Uh, you could talk about happiness, for example, or you could talk about satisfaction. You know, when are we satisfied? When are we happy? When do we have a good life? I don't like these terms because I think life is good. In a, it, it's, not, it, it's not a form or a structure, it's a process, right? And, it's, it, and my claim is it depends on relation, on relationships in a certain sense. I could also go at this, and this is why I call in German from the talk in German about the, das gelingende Leben. And it's translated as, as the successful life. And I don't like the term successful at all. It's not about success, right? It's about when is life as it might be, as it was supposed to be. And now the interesting thing is, I said, I said that we are, that we are driven by, by the idea that um, uh, um, increasing the horizon is the good thing, but the, the problem is alienation, which is a, a beziehungslose Beziehung. It's, it's a state of affairs where we do have a lot of relations, but they seem to be without an internal relation. So now the interesting question is, what is a related relationship? If alienation is a non-related relationship, a relationship that's utterly non-related, then the question is, how could we think of a, of a meaningful relationship or a, a meaningful uh, form of relationship? And my, my answer to this is resonance. Now, what is resonance? Basically, it must be the opposite to alienation. I want to develop the, thera the therapy out of the diagnosis, and the analysis. Now, the question, so therefore, the question is, what is the opposite of alienation? This is how I came to the concept of resonance. I asked myself, okay, I know what alienation is. You sit in the lecture and think, oh my God, how did I get here? Hopefully, he will finish soon, right? And by the way, the, the indications is that you permanently think about what you did before, because it was much more interesting or what you will do afterwards, right? If you're kind of alienated, and every student knows what alienation in this sense means, right? <laughs> you think of what you need to do afterwards or what you want to do afterwards, right? So when does this change? What's a non-alienated form of being in a lecture, for example, or in a concert or anywhere in the world? It's, it's when all of a sudden you could say when you concentrate without effort, because all of a sudden, Someone says something, or you see something, or you hear something that speaks to you, that touches you. It's really a form of liquefaction between yourself and the world. All of a sudden, you're really kind of attentive without forcing yourself, right? Without a threat that you will miss 
get a bad grade if you don't pay attention or so. But all of a sudden something affects you. That's the first element, right? I call it affection because it's really, you know, and the thing is, it's a passive moment. Someone says something or you might see someone whom you really like or would like to come to like, right? Uh, so affection is like something is done to you. This is why I use these arrows, right? It can be a music, right? All of a sudden someone plays a music and you know I, I'm working and I'm in a really bad mood and all of a sudden what's this sound, right? And then you don't think about what you did before or what you would want to do later, right? It's being touched, moved or called by something. Bruno Latour, the French Sociologist actually he comes up with very similar ideas. He says when you hear a call, something is calling me. And for example, a lot of young people feel called by the ecological problem. Right? Then they don't say my life is so meaningless, I don't know what to do. They say I know what I want to do. It's something is affecting me. Right? It's really breaking the armor, getting out of the hamster wheel of our everyday mode. Right? So the first element is being touched by something and it very often it's not what is in the center of the, it might be something I say, right? You're totally bored and tired and you hate me <laughs> and all of a sudden you think, oh, but this is interesting and interesting doesn't even mean you agree, right? You might disagree and this is exactly what is touching you that you think, but that's completely wrong. But very often it's not in the center, it's not me, it's someone, someone in here says something someone in here says in the discussion later, right? Or a thought that comes to you totally independent of what's or, or kind of almost independent of what's going on here. But whatever it is, the first element of be getting out of an alienation is affection. And if you're burnt out or close to burnout, you know, think of someone sitting at his desk or his table in the evening saying, my, my life is completely meaningless, right? I could just as well kill myself, right? Probably I don't even have the power to kill myself. That's a kind of burnout state, right? And when does it change? Not when he or she gets a new theory about life. It changes when all of a sudden something is calling him or her. He might fall in love, for example. Right? So, but nevertheless, let's go back to the lecture. It, resonance is not just something is falling into you or is hitting you or touching you. If it happens, some music you respond to, then you really, then you answer it, right? It, that's why I use the word emotion. It literally means from Latin, emovere, moving outward, right? And you see it, every one of you, I think quite a lot of you teach or preach, right, in the church, for example, uh, or speak to people, give talks, and you know what it means to be in a, with an alienated audience, right? They sit like, I'm, I'm totally disinterested. So when, you, when you teach students in, in, in high school or wherever, you know what it is. And when there is resonance, right, you really, they change the way they sit. They change the look in their eyes, right? You really see eyes lighting up, leuchtende Augen is my favorite term in German, right? You can see it in the eyes when there is this responsive element. There is a kind of, that's a related relationship you reach out to. That's interesting what you say there, Let, let's discuss this. And you might disagree. If it's total agreement, very often you don't have this reaction. But resonance is a response to to a call, right? So you answer it, you do something with it, and you see it in the way you sit, you see it in the eyes. Very often, if it's a strong call, a strong touch, very often people have tears in their eyes, if it's with music, for example, but it might be a story. Someone gives a story. I mean, you know, I find this really fascinating. Sometimes, I've recently, I've listened to a kind of speech by, a, by, a, by someone, by a, by a teacher, who, or by, a, by a, a head of a school who retired, and he was giving a speech and it was quite long and quite boring. But then he talked about his own teacher, the, 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 the one who taught him Latin and how important he was for his life. And that he really wanted, when he realized that he wanted to visit the teacher to tell him how important he was, but the teacher had died. And this was a moment there was complete silence in the audience. You could really see, you could see there was resonance in the speaker and it created immediate resonance in the audience. And every, every musician tells, musicians always talk about this, that they feel when all of a sudden they are in resonance with each other and with the audience. Audience. It's like energy going back and forth, right? So what I want to say here is the first element is being touched by something, but the second is do something with it, feeling alive. It's giving you a sense of self-efficacy. All of a sudden, I'm involved, I'm doing something, I'm working on it. And if this, 
if this element of, I call it liquefaction in the relationship between self and world, if this happens, one is transformed, right? After this moment in the lecture, or after such a moment in music, or after such a, when you, tra when you travel a country and you're quite, quite tired, and all of a sudden you see something, whatever it is, could be interaction or landscape, then you're not no longer the same. There's an element of transformation. There's always an element of transformation. Sometimes it's life changing. When you do biographical interviews, what we do in sociology, people actually say they, they structure their narration along experiences of resonance. Right? They say, you know, I was, let's say, in Helsinki, I was studying such and such. And all of a sudden I met this guy or I heard this, uh, I don't know, uh, or the, 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 the professor said something and after that I was a different person. You even find it in the most banal places. I read an interview with Robert Trujillo, um, the, ba the bass player of the rock band Metallica. right? And he said, I went to this concert by Stephen Wilson and when I was there I had tears in my eyes and after that I was a different person. It's a kind of almost everyday narration. People talk about these moments where something hit them right? and they answer to it and then and this has always a transformative element. It doesn't have to be life-changing but it, at least it changes your, the mood you're in. right? And I've written a whole book on this. I think this, the last element of resonance is is where it deviates from the modern logic of increase, of systematic optimization and rationalization and so on. You can, uh, it's uncontrollability, unverfügbarkeit von resonance, and it, that means it's uncontrollable in a dual sense. First, you cannot engineer resonance, you cannot ensure it, you cannot guarantee it. We always try to do it because we commodify it. For example, I read there's a cruise to the polar sea, to the north, northern sea, which gives you a guarantee for this foreseeing polar lights, polar light guarantee, right? If you don't see polar lights, you get your money back. That, that, that's, that's really true. I mean, that's the attempt to commodify resonance. Right? You will have this amazing experience. Now, the problem is you can commodify, even guarantee that you see the light, but you can never guarantee that this is really going to be an experience of resonance for you, right? Because perhaps you have a headache or you're in a bad mood or whatever, and nothing happens, right? So you cannot fabricate, engineer, guarantee, control the moment of resonance. And by the way, in something what we do like here, getting into discussion with each other, with, with each other uncontrollability means on the first place, maybe it's going to be a boring evening for you and for me, right? Or for all of us, because I say what I always say, and you ask what you always ask or so, and then there is no resonance. But maybe there is. But what is more interesting is if there is a point in our discussion, in our, in, in, in our talking to each other, no one can predict what this point will be and what will come out of it. Because resonance is the moment, I really believe with Hannah Arendt, it's the moment of innovation where all of a sudden the new ideas start, right? Really, this is the way new ideas come into the world and also new social movements and everything that the, 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 the truly innovative comes out of a uncontrollable moment, right, of resonance, something happened. This guy said that and the other, and the, the, the woman answered and then uh, the girl at the back had this third idea and then we somehow moved into a direction that was absolutely uncontrollable. Resonance is uncontrollable in the sense it's open-ended. You don't know when it starts or ends and you don't know what the result of elements of resonance is. Uh, uh, and actually I think I've put too much in it. I will, I, will fin it. I, I will finish in a second, right? I have just one more slide, but I will not, I will just give you the ideas I, I have. I mean, my, my claim is that you can even develop an ethics out of this because being in resonance is its responsibility. You see, I played with the words here, responsibility. Normally in English you write with an I instead of an A, right? But I believe resonance is really responsibility, being able and willing to enter in this kind of responsive relationship of listening, being called by something and answering. And this involves an ethic because if I'm in this, in resonance with something, I, I necessarily, I believe it's care ethics involved there. I don't want to destroy it. I want to preserve it. This, the thing that is talking to me, the music, the flower, the animal, the person, the earth, right? Nature, whatever it is, uh, is kind of talking to me and it's important and it's independent of me and then you then you, would, you will never step on it in order to get a, a nice picture for Instagram and <laughs> I also I, I, and what is really 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 important for me is that even in the self-help books on the psychological side I think modernities the, the modern social formation always puts the activity on the subject 
right? It's always, you always read, you have to be autonomous, you have to be authentic, you even have to be creative. You have to be, probably there will soon be books, you have to be resonant, right? <laughs> you have to be mindful. It's always the idea, oh, I have to do something. I, and now, now I'll be really mindful, now I will meditate and so on. But resonance starts with the other, right? It's, it's, you, you need this other and it's, there is a moment of passivity involved. Listen, in German we have this wonderful word, aufhören. It's, 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 basic, it's always translated as stopping, right? But aufhören does not just mean to stop, it means to listen upwards, right? Trying to be attentive to what is calling you, right? So, 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 so I, 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 my claim is that, uh, I have another lecture on this, I can't give it right now, right? <laughs> we always move between activity and passivity. Either I throw or I am thrown. But resonance is exactly in between, when you cannot say whether you throw or you are thrown. I give you my favorite example. I read a student wrote an MA paper about dancing. And she was really doing a great job and she said, a dancing is a resonant activity because you have to be, you permanently switch between receiving impulses if the, other, if the partner is leading and giving impulses if you are leading. So you're permanently either taking or sending signals. And then I thought, and I discussed it with a lot of people in between, that when the dance is at the climax, when it really gets intense, when it gets resonant, you can no longer say whether you are leading or whether you are led. It's exactly in between. You have this experience of self-efficacy, but it's, it's passive listening and active at the same moment. There is this great poem by Yeats, right? Uh, among school children, it's called. And it ends with, who can tell the dancer from the dance? Right? You cannot tell. Whether, whether it's not something I do, it's just as much something that happens to me. And this is what musicians say, right? At the climax of, the, if they do improvisation, for example, you cannot tell who is leading. It's like, it's like the music is it's doing itself, and I believe it's the same with the discussion. If only I make my arguments and defend my theory, it's not resonance. It's if, you can, if I can, and it does happen, right, C quite often actually. Afterwards, I don't know, was it my idea or was it your idea or whose idea was it? It wasn't anyone's idea. It was kind of springing out of the discussion. So this is what I call medio passivity. It's not that I'm totally passive, but it's not that I'm just doing something, right? So it's in between the passive and the active. Now this form, last slide, I swear, <laughs> I believe that this form of resonant relationship can be turned into a political program even, right, into a sociological idea. Once you realize that resonance is not something I do, it depends on the other side as well, and it's sometimes it's on the institutional context. Some contexts allow for resonance, other contexts kind of prevent context uh, resonance. And there are kind of four dimensions or four axes in which people experience resonance. One is social, between human beings, when we talk to each other, in love, a love relationship, an intimate relationship is a relationship of resonance. This is how we understand it, right? Listening and answering, and kind of medio passivity. And it's the same with, uh, with the uh, parents and children, for example, and I believe even in democracy. Democracy does only work, it's based on the idea of resonance. Listening to those who believe differently, who, who, who even love differently, who talk differently, right? Listening and answering, entering to it in dialogue. Not, it's not, I believe it's, a, I believe it's a mistake if in politics we think it's about interest struggle, right? But only about conflict, trying to get, force your way against the other, trying to force hegemonies in order to kind of to, to, to be stronger than the others. I, I believe democracy doesn't work that way. The, I, I'm a defender of the Republican idea, which means we can listen and answer and thereby we are transformed into a mode of, of collectively structuring in our world. But resonance is not only between human beings, it's also, by, by the way, to animals, for example, but it's also with material objects. People do get in resonance with objects. It can be objects of art. Look at this wonderful vase or so. It's somehow speaking to me or the, the, or the, or the, or the image or so. But they do get in resonance with their work. I mean, the baker and the dough. I know it because my father was a baker, right? When he talked about the dough, it, it, it was a resonant relationship. He said, you have to listen. He did, probably didn't say listen. You have to watch it, right? You have, you have to observe it. You have to try to... to it, it was a kind of resonance. You know, it's doing something. The yeast, it's, every yeast has a kind of different dynamics, right? And sometimes you have to push harder. Sometimes you have to give it more time. Sometimes you have to give it less time. It's even uncontrollable because it's, he said every time the bread comes out of the oven a bit differently, right? It's not always the same bread. Only in our 
modern uh, industry. You get always the same bread, but it's like resonance. And I thought, okay, that's a par particular thing about bakers, but it's completely wrong. It's true for almost every profession, right? If people working with wood, they have the same relationship to the wood. They say, look at it, try to do something with it. It's true for the gardener. It's true for the, by the way, it's certainly true for the farmer, but it's even true for you if you have to write essays and papers or newspaper articles, right? Because the text always speaks something different from what you wanted to say, right? And it's like listening and answering. And actually, while you write the text, it transforms what you think. And certainly you feel self-efficacy, right? I, 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 I form, I shape the text, I produce it, but the text produces me too. It's resonance to things. That's the second axis. The third is what I call the existential axis of being. I believe, you know, I really believe human beings have this double sense. Sometimes we experience the world as dead, silent, gray, hostile. That's what Camus talks about or Nietzsche talks about. And since I think it has, it has something to do with death, Whenever we are confronted with death, not always, but most of the time, it's the hostile world and that's a reality. But we also have a sense of a resonant world, right, which is, and, 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 and there are experiences of at the, what is at the bottom of our existence. And I believe sometimes we experience it's, a, it's an answering, a, reson, a responding world. I believe this is the point of religion. Religion gives you the idea that at the heart of your existence, underneath your existence, there is an answering, right? And, and, and a responding reality. I have called you by your name, you are mine. For example, you hear in Christian uh, in, in, in services, right, or theology. Or you have given me the breath of life. Those are images, it's ideas of resonance. Something is in resonance with me. And the interesting thing there is, this creates a kind of, the sense of an axis, because ask yourself, I ask this as a sociologist, right? You don't have to believe anything. But if you think, if, if you analyze the practice of praying, the question arises, is the person who prays turning inward or outward? And the interesting answer to the question is into, in both directions at the same time. It's, it's, it's a practice which somehow gives you the experience that your innermost being is related to the outermost, the encompassing reality in the sense of Karl Jaspers. There is an axis of existence running through me. And this experience does not necessarily have to be a religious one. People have the same experience when they stand at the shore at the ocean. Or maybe the Baltic Sea is enough for this, right? You stand, <laughs> you stand at the border and the waves roll in. And you really, literally, you change your physical presence. It's like it's your innermost being opens up to this encompassing reality. And it's the same in music, even in rock music. Henry Rollins, the punk musician, it's quite, quite heavy music, right? He says, music is closer to you than your, than your own breath. It's the innermost reality. And of course, it fills the, the, the room around you. It's the inner and the outer. So there's, a, I call this the existential axis of resonance. And we have to keep, to, to preserve the sense of this existential relationship and to have institutions where we can make this experience. And finally, we need a kind of self-axis of resonance. We can be in resonance with our own body or with our, our own psyche or with our own biography, right? So a good society, the society I'm looking for, and the, 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 the social formation, which I suggest as therapeutic, therapeutic is a society that enables its members its, or the, 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 the people in a social formation to develop and as, to establish and maintain axis of resonance along, along, these four, uh, along these four dimensions. That's about the idea I wanted to uh, talk with you about in order to really have a discussion. I stop right now. Thank you very much for your long attention. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just before I begin, I'm going to check with the tech colleagues that I am indeed resonating. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my job is to uh, give a brief response to the talk, and I am going to be brief and fast. In other words, I'm going to be highly accelerated <laughs> in order to avoid alienation. <laughs> 
So thank you, <laughs> Professor Rosa, uh, for what only could be described as a tour de force. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, it was deep, it was serious, but it was also fun. <laughs> and fun is not normally what we associate with German philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. So I'm going to ask three questions to you. If they don't resonate, don't bother to answer. <laughs> and the first one is this. So as I was listening to your talk, which is in the genre of social theory, I was reminded of one of the greatest of all social theorists, perhaps the greatest English social theorist, not Anthony Giddens, but rather Monty Python. <laughs> Now, you will recall at the end of the film Life of Brian, there is a song called Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. <laughs> and Monty Python wrote a lyric within that song that goes, Life's a piece of shit <laughs> when you look at it. <laughs> and I was reminded of lots of grumpy talk that you hear in pubs, or at least while you could still go to the pub before Corona. Mm. And people would sit grumpily in pubs going, life's rubbish today, society's rubbish today, it's just getting more rubbish, the future is rubbish. Unless you're Elon Musk flying out into space. Mm -hmm. And everything's just rubbish, and that's it. Question, true or not? <laughs> Second question. Social theory, and I'm coming at this from I do it myself, social theory often involves very big words, especially in German, very big words that take up about four lines each. <laughs> and so it's not, it's not the most easy thing to read in the world. Mm. But at the start, you talked about how social theory can contribute mm. to, if not making things better, at least stimulating dialogue. And you mentioned various countries. Mm -hmm. So how is it when we are doing social theory as mm -hmm. intellectuals and philosophers and so on, and we use big words and we use jargon and so on, how, without sacrificing the complexity and the depth of hopefully what we're saying, mm -hmm. do we reach big publics, including people in places like Kenya, as you mentioned? Yeah. That was the second one. Yes. And then the third one comes out of an observation, an empirical social psychological observation from the experiment we saw this evening. Because when Professor Rosa asked people to put up their hands if they had considered decelerating because they were feeling burnout, I did a quick observation of the audience. And what was quite remarkable was that the practically the only people who did not put up their hands where the retired people. <laughs> For them, of course, on their comfortable pensions, <laughs> produced in an earlier phase of the welfare state, for them every morning is a paradise of champagne and Koskenkorva. <laughs> But for the rest of us, always on the edge of burnout, thinking, how the hell am I going to get through the next week? Perhaps we feel in despair. Should we actually feel despair? Yeah. Or, what is, <laughs> we should. We should. <laughs> but if we are not to do, as Camus said, and commit the biggest philosophical act of all, if we're not to kill ourselves, <laughs> then, what is the Rosa therapy? And is it capturable by an image I had as you spoke? The soul gleefully running down the wrong way, down the up escalator. Third question. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Yeah, Rosa. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it seems to me that was even more fun <laughs> listening to you. Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, three questions. Maybe this time I start with the first one. 
<laughs> yeah. Normally I go, I do it backward. Uh, with, with the, is life just rubbish? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, by the way, I love, I love rock music, as I said. I'm, and, and, and even, you know, a lot of songs are, I think, it's really interesting. Why do we listen so much without rock on pop music uh, or hip-hop or whatever it is, right? I think the society would not exist. And it's not because it's so deep and meaningful what they say. It's because you hear another voice that somehow connects to you. That always gives you a sense of resonance, right? So I like rock music and I like the life of Brian a lot. I like Monty Python, but I never liked that song. I don't quite know why. Maybe you open my eyes <laughs> for it. I don't know. I don't, I don't like it. Um, but uh, I would not say, uh, certainly I wouldn't say that life is just rubbish. I mean, why should I? I mean, in your, in my, I would like to respond in two ways. On the one hand, I think it's probably true that people, at least in modernity, always thought that life is awful and it's getting worse. I mean, that's nothing new. I mean, that's, uh, we really have to keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes I really wonder, because people are now convinced this time it's really serious about climate crisis, right? And I believe myself this time it is really serious. But when I was younger, there were many occasions where people thought the same in the Cuba crisis, right? This time it's really serious, probably it's the end. And also, and then with the nuclear rearmament in, in the big debate in Germany, you know, my, it, the generation said you cannot have kids in this world because they will die anyway, and also because of the nuclear power stations. And then when I was about, about 18 or so, th there, we really were convinced that a few years later all the forests would be dead, all the lakes would be dead, and we could only m move outside with gas masks, right? So, uh, so, and and, before, and uh, so, the sense of crisis we're moving down into the abyss seems to be, a, and I'm not even sure whether it's just modernity, because before that, in Christianity, people were always expecting the apocalypse, and they thought you already see the signs, right? And so, I'm not sure whether this pessimistic note is a kind of <laughs> maybe even a necessary feature of life. But uh, w w from my theory, would the consequence be that life is rubbish? Certainly not. I mean, because I believe we, as human beings, we are resonant beings. When you look at newborn babies, right, the first thing they do is not being reasonable or language animals, not even possessive animals, but they immediately try to get in resonance with the world. So I believe it's our basic capacity. And, 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 and experiences of resonance certainly are not rubbish. So I... So I'm quite optimistic myself. I just think we should get out of this uh, situation. Uh, social theory, it's true. I mean, a lot of it is very abstract. For example, this is one of the reasons why I don't quite like <laughs> Niklas Luhmann. <laughs> but, uh, but it's not impossible. I mean, when you want to write the best account, as I do, it must be possible to talk to people with non-academic background to very, and I'd, of course, I mean, whatever you do as an individual there is very, very limited. But my attempt is, for example, I really, I talk to people in the church, it's called Vesperkirche, I don't know how to translate that, where homeless and mentally uh, challenged uh, people meet. And I really want to talk to them and I would really say, uh, or for example, or to, to waste pickers in Brazil or to the uh, landless community there and to students in, in India and I, or to people in China and I would really say, of course it's possible to talk about what alienation is and what resonance could be, experiences of resonance. And for example, homeless people sitting in the street, they would immediately tell you, I remember one discussion where I kind of talked about this and there was a colleague who said, you know, what you say is only a, resonance is a theory for the, for, the, for the upper classes or for the middle classes of the industrialized societies. The poor would never understand it. And then actually a person said, you know, I have been homeless for a long time and I'm still unemployed and I know exactly what resonance is, right? Because when you sit in the street, one problem is you don't get enough money. But being treated like a stone, for example, right? Having no resonance at all probably is the worst part. So for me, resonance is not a luxury good. It's a basic human experience. And I believe people in Kenya and everywhere get a sense of what alienation is, what resonance is, and what, acceler what, what uh, acceleration is. You have to use different terms, right? I mean, resonance and alienation are academic second order descriptions. But when you go down to the experience, I really believe you can talk to all sorts of people, even to children. Philosophy with children is another interesting, uh, an interesting uh, topic, and you can do it. You can talk with them about their sense of time, changes in their sense of time, and, and so on. So I believe, and I believe, if social theory needs to have any value, it must be possible to translate it backwards, right? You have to, of course, then you have to do abstractions, levels of abstractions, go upwards and into the academic world. But if you lose the connection, then it's going to be really bad. And the first question was, I have the bullshit question, the Kenya question, the last question was, what was the last question? 
Oh yes, uh, da running downward, the downward escalator. Yes, um, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, my my my, my claim is, I mean, we, we cannot do it individually. I'm really, I want to say, you cannot get a. It's the Adorno quote: "Es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen." Right? It's not a kind of self-help theory which tells you what to do in a bad world. But but I, but I, but I hope what I want to do is so. Therefore, I believe it's a kind of political. It is a political agenda, right? But on a, not on a surface level, there is not one reform that will bring about everything. Uh, that will will set everything right, right? It's. A, I really believe what I have in mind is a, is a, a change at the level of the basic. It's a le at the level of existence, and I believe that's true to the older critical theory. Adorno and Marcuse, and they all, they wanted a different mode of existence. And of course, as I said, we probably need to come up with economic reforms and political reforms for this, but we need to have an idea of where we want to go to. And this is what, the, this, what resonance theory, I hope, could provide. And since we all know, as human beings, what resonance is, I hope that we can kind of draw, create the vision and the force out of this idea. It's a very feeble attempt at doing something, but just running down the, just running the downward escalator. I mean, I know what you have in mind. Maybe that's a good idea too. I will think about it uh, next time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So are there any other observations? And resonance is not agreement and harmony, right? I mean, it, the, the most resonant experience is when you really argue about something. So if you think I'm wrong, I'm happy to hear. Okay. Yeah. We'll see. We'll take a few questions from the audience. Mm. And I'll take One of the prizes, and I was really happy that in the end you spoke about care ethic and as mm. a care researcher, uh, one of the prizes that care researchers have been discussing a lot recently is the crisis of reproduction, which also obviously stems, I would, in your, uh, I would see that it yeah. does stem from this desynchronization uh, uh, at the structural level. Yes. So in the sense that uh, care as, as work and as labor does not fit often the capitalist logic of yes. time, etc. So how could we solve, or how could mm. we include, or how could you, or we together <laughs> in this resonant uh, situation think about solutions to uh, the you, you want to connect a bit, or, or maybe I can try and answer until, until you get the next... There were some other questions, no? So maybe, maybe we can take two. Crisis of reproduction, I will keep in mind here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jürgen Wolf. I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher here. Um, in my dissertation, I uh, did ethnographic, an ethnographic study on participatory democracy. And I was particularly interested in this idea that participation can make for better citizens. Mm. That is, uh, participatory experience uh, can cause a kind of transformation, mm. um, especially if the method of participation is culturally, culturally resonant to yeah. the person who is participating. And um, you stated in your lecture that you believe there's a certain uncontrollability in resonance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to ask you, mm. do you, do you think there are still some factors that might increase the likelihood mm. of a resonant experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Thank you for these two questions. This time I start with, the, with, the, with this one first, and then I, I go to the other. I think. I mean, for, for, I mean, there are two two interesting uh, points about this. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, when I state that uh, resonance is uncontrollable, it sounds like then the, then there's nothing we can do about it. Actually, this this the, the problem is then 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 we cannot use resonance to turn the world into a better place because it's uncontrollable anyway, right? And uh, that's that's not the, that's not the whole truth. I, what I mean is that the the real uh, the, the moment of resonance, right, is a kind of uncontrollable. But of course, there are conditions conditions which enable resonance. Uh, resonance. I, I, one, element, one, one thing I, I left aside this time is that I claim resonance requires a, as an accommodating space of resonance, not under all conditions it's possible, right? For example, there are a lot of 
a, a, a institutional killers of resonance. When you're, sh when you're short on time, for example, you will not get into resonance, right? I have to catch my plane so I cannot get in resonance with you. And also, if you are a kind of incompetitive situation, it's either me or you, we will certainly not be in resonance. And if you're, if, if you are under in, in anxiety, right? Fear is a resonance killer. We actually know this even from psychological experiments. When you fear each other or you fear the situation, you will not open up because you know resonance is a risk. It means opening up to some other which you cannot control and you enter into a process which is uncontrollable. So for example, being traumatized is one reason for not getting in resonance. When you have made the experience that being touched means being hurt, you will not allow anyone to touch you, right? So, for, so what in, in that sense, you need to create a, a resonant space that does not produce resonance, but it produces the conditions that enable resonance, right? So it's exactly as you said, you need an institutional setting which is resonant maybe to prior cultural experiences, right? And which creates the possibility of, without fear, opening up to each other and, and, and participating. And then, and then that's my hope really, that you can create spaces of, 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 uh, of resonant participatory democracy, which also transforms those involved. And by the way, people like Fishkin, and there are, there's even better research, right, who have showed that this actually happens. It's, it's fascinating. In, in, in settings, which are aleatory or participatory settings, right, people actually do move. He, he, he did observe, at least he claims, he has empirical data, that uh, shows that in such a participatory setting, when it's resonant, people somehow seem to move towards each other, right? They become open for the arguments of the other side and they change. But for example, in the internet, that's very interesting. I mean, the, in, the people do care for the opinions of the other, but they don't gravitate, they rather polarize. So that's ob ob obviously a non-resonant uh, non space. Now, th on, the, on the other question, I don't know what it would be an elegant way of going from there to there. Um, but uh, with, the care, with the care ethics, I mean, you know, I think, I mean, I don't have maybe a good solution, but I found it very interesting as an explanation. Uh, I mean, care, you know, I mean, why are care relationships are kind of very difficult. People don't want to have them and they don't pay for it and so on, right? But look, for example, at kids. I mean, we know that birth rates go down sometimes dramatically, right? Why? I think it's very easy to explain it from, from my analysis because a kid is... A kid is the, probably the single most thing that reduces your horizon of availability, attainability, and accessibility most dramatically, right? If you have a kid, yeah, it's true. I mean, if you if you have a kid, yeah, the other thing is you don't you cannot get rid of it easily. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it will stick with you for 18 years. Actually, there's nothing worse you can do to yourself uh, to reduce the horizon of availability, attainability, and accessibility. And I think that's the explanation. It's not just money and so on, right? It's the fact that it kind of limits you, what, what you can do on a daily basis. You cannot just go to the opera if you have an infant at home, right? No matter how much you like. And, and you cannot say, oh, I take the new job in the Philippines because it's attractive if you have two kids who go to school here. So, so, so kids are kind of killing your <laughs> horizon of... But nevertheless, if you ask people about what, what, is, what is giving them emotions, feelings, a sense of significance and happiness in their life, they very often answer the kid. It's very strange, right? I mean, the thing which is the worst from the lo dominant logic is the thing that is most attractive. I mean, at least for many people, right? I mean, we know that kids are not always the source of happiness, <laughs> but sometimes. So, I, so, 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 and of course, it's a little harder if if it comes for care for the for the old age or for the for the for the sick, right? Because rarely anyone would say caring for my sick grandmother is the source of happiness in my life. Then you really the, the, there it's kind of uh, even worse. But my but my idea is that once we realize individually and as a society that the, the, the good does not come from the expansion of the horizon, but from the quality of relationship we would automatically change the, the, the meaning care has for our life. We would, I mean, that's, that, that's my hope, right? I mean, of course, the problem is how do we pay for it? That's always the question because everyone says we should have more money in the care sectors, but then they don't want to pay for it. So, so I mean, I don't have a good set of institutional reforms we need to implement and then everything would be solved. But if, 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 the, if the core idea is true that what we need is a change in our basic orientation towards life, then, they would have, then that would have significant consequences in how we approach and deal with the caring. With caring. Okay. okay, we have two more questions. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
inspiring talk. So I appreciate it with, with me. And I'm one of the happy retired persons. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I wanted to say something about him. I'm feeling supported at the door. Of course, there was something that the previous professor saw, which is obviously the department. And the fact that the previous part, you speak about the concept of resonance, and you have numerous examples of mm -hmm. resonance, not, not alienated, so to say, yes. when the world around us somehow resonates and yes. talks to us, and we yes. respond to it, all from the uh, uh, real moments, so life changing moments. The first laugh, of course, probably the laugh is classical. Yes, yes, yes. Or that kind of romantic poetry, which yeah, you yeah. Like as well in, the, in your books. And because all the, all the way making great points, that's the way it comes close to the flow. Yes. The situation of flow, feeling of being in flow, you will close yes, your yes. Mm -hmm. or you will maybe have one with the nose with the, the, the or the yeah. voice, so mm. to say. And, and even with, with the dialogues yes. and, recently and so forth. And some of these are very real moments, which you probably are expect to experience only once in a lifetime. But yes. Some life change. Some of yes. are very, can be very, very routinized. Yes. And we will learn to, 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 be, to get to the flow, yes. the flow that kind mm -hmm. of practicing that kind of thing, so all the thing in between. Mm. So, and, and there's of course a danger of routinization as well. Mm -hmm. Is it something that we, we sometimes need all the time new. Mm. Yes, a good question. Uh, yeah. you know, experiences like that. And I'll be ha hungry for them. I'll yes. Be to be lose them. And it's something that we need to fall in love with. Always <laughs> again, so to say. Yeah. And what has all this through? This big question with them. This missing the link with, yes. the, with the, our poverty's mode of production. That is yes. something that, that, uh, that after the revolution, mm. Does it change everything in this respect, though, or in some? I hope so. Do we fall in love even more easier then? No. Okay. Sorry, can okay. we take this second yes, question okay. as well? Mm -hmm. About routines. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Anne. But just asking me to be short. I'm never short, but I try to. <laughs> so I was thinking and trying to make sense on my own own um, notes. I was thinking about the subjectivity of the late modern person, and you say that it's driven by the fear of being left out and also on the desire to increase one horizon. And this got me thinking of this very, very fascinating research project in Finland, I'm not part of it currently, going on where a bunch of researchers have followed since 2015 uh, young people who at the time were 15 years old mm -hmm. and they're going to going to follow them up some years now um, and they're just coming up with their first research yeah, results and they had um, young people in two big cities in Finland and then some like also on the countryside and then from the countryside sample or the data there were these young people um, especially girls who said that they can't stay and live in the village. They, they need to get out. They need to move to the big city yeah. because the village is conservative. They have no sort of like, there's prospects for the future are yes. very, they can be mothers, mm. but that's kind of like it. Mm. The boys on the other hand, seem to have a future in the village. Yeah, yeah. And, and to the point that the young girls discussed among themselves that they don't want to fall in love with the village boys mm -hmm. because that might result in them Staying, not yeah. sticking and not being able to uh, pursue freedom. Like, I was thinking that you didn't yes. talk anything about because, Gen well, Gen. because for these girls it might be fear of, uh, yeah, losing, but losing potential yeah. freedoms yes. to sort of like explore yes. themselves. And then I would ask, what would be the solution? Mm. Should these girls now find some sort of like uh, uh, affective no, 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 yeah. thing that they would sort of like understand that they want to stay in the village? Mm. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, very good question. It is because in, in many aspects, really, because, you know, I actually thought my, my sense of care ethics sounds or could become very conservative, right? Kind of preserving what is there, right? I mean, it has, it, it's good when it comes to the ecology, for example, right? Having a sense of 
preserving the spaces, the animals and everything. But that would then actually mean trying to preserve the, the rural uh, or the, whatever it is, the, the social arrangements which are, which are very unfair in many aspects. And then I realized, no, the, when resonance, when the resonance is the sense of trying to preserve what is there, but not what is there as an institution or a structure, but as something that can speak to you, like a girl, for example, right? And I believe, I, I think one can explain what you described, it's, it's the same in Germany and anywhere, right? The girls want to move to the city, while the boys, very often they stay at home, and, and, and that, that creates an, uh, other forms of problems. And I think, on the one hand, it's true, you know, the horizon of your, what you can do is larger for boys than it is for girls on the countryside. So it's true as a description, right? But I believe even in terms of resonance, you know, the, the problem with traditional, most often, not always, but most often, traditional rural settings is that women were not allowed to develop their own axis of resonance and their own voices, right? Find out what you, who you really are and what you want to be. You just have to be what your husband wants you to be or your boyfriend or your parents or so, right? So I think it's really true the traditional gender setting in our societies did not give women or for example gay people or so or homosexual people the, the, the possibility to develop their axis of resonance. So, so I think they are driven towards the city not just because they want to expand the horizon of, of availability but also because they want to develop their senses of resonance, right? So my answer would be to that sense, yes, we have to. It, it's my, my, the theory of resonance is not conservative in the sense that you have to preserve the relationships that are there all the time, right? We would have to find settings, maybe rural settings, that allow resonance for those who, do, who, who are not male, heterosexual, and so on, boys. So yeah, so, it's, so that would be the answer to this. And the routine question is very interesting too. It's actually, it's, it's super interesting. We have, a, we have in, in, in Erfurt on the Max Weber Center together with the University of Graz a doctoral school and it's called Ritual and Resonance, right? And the, and the idea there is that, uh, you know, it, because of the dispositional setting, uh, it kind of, it, it sometimes takes rituals. For example, you enter even in the participatory thing, right? Once you enter that space or you enter a museum or a concert hall or, or, or a service, if you're religious, you kind of dispositionally open up towards being in resonance. Now the interesting thing is now the interesting thing is that it can it work to the opposite, right? You 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 feel that the ritual becomes dead. It's the same thing every time, right? So you don't fall into this hot elements of, of resonance. Uh, so so the thing is when you fall in love, I now I mean, when you fall in love, you have this kind of, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary situation. It doesn't happen too often in your life. I think you cannot reproduce it at will, certainly, right? And it's the same, with resonance as I've defined it today, is always this kind of extraordinary peak experience, which you have sometimes in the concert hall or in the lecture or in, in, in love, right? But you don't have it every, you cannot routinize it, right? I would really say. But now I believe we need a new concept. We actually have decided in, in Erfurt and Graz, we need something, I now call it second order resonance, right? And for example, a marriage, because you were talking about love, right? Is an example of second order resonance, right? At first is really being totally overwhelmed by the person you fall in love with, right? It's, it's this hot peak experience of being in love, which creates even a hormonal state of extraordinary, of the extraordinary. But then, you, you know, but then after time you kind of get in a kind of second order resonance. You know that with this person there's always the possibility to enter into a resonant, to, into moments of resonance or exchanges of resonance. It's the same with if you're a religious person, right, for example, right? It's not that every time you go to the Sunday service you have this hot experience of a religious experience. No, it's second order resonance. You are reminded that when you're in church that there is this dimension in your life. There is this background sense of being connected, right? It's the same what people have if they are in classical music. Very often the concert doesn't really get them into ecstasy, right? But whenever they sit there and the orchestra starts to play, they have this sense, yes, there is this fear of being. It even changes their body. So what I want to say is you cannot fall in love every other week or so. It's, that's impossible. And it wouldn't even, and it would never create this sense of second order resonance, right? But actually, on this point, I believe I have to seriously, or at least to some extent, reformulate my theory. I haven't done that completely yet. <laughs> I have to come up with a, but you know, I never want to blindly defend what I have written. Maybe there are flaws, and I think that's a problem, right? I have to move away from only the people. 
experience. But actually, I would defend. I'm not sure whether I would defend. But they retired. Sometimes are very short on time too. Right? That's the strange experience, right? <laughs> that you live have a very accelerated life even after retirement. So we are all in this together. <laughs> so that's that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the. Thank you. Thank you.